Welcome to the uh, online causal inference seminar. Today, we are excited to have Justin Grimmer, Dean Knox, and Brandon Stewart talk about naive regression requires weaker assumptions and factor models to adjust for multiple cause confounding. Um, they will also watch a Q&A, so please, if you have any questions, uh, submit them there. Um, after the talk, we'll have a discussion by uh, Betsy Ockburn, uh, Ilya Spitzer, and Eric chetkin chetkin are also with us uh, today. So if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. All right, um, questions today will be handled by Guillaume. Uh, so I'm going to switch over to him now. Thank you, Dominique. Um, so um, all three authors are um, here today. So um, Justin, Dean, and, and, and Brandon. So um, uh, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. Um, and we'll uh, select a few questions and ask them live um, during the talk, as usual. So uh, please do not raise your hand until I've asked you to do so. Um, all right, that's pretty much it for me. Um, Justin, Dean, Brandon, whenever you guys are ready. Great, and can we swap over the screen share? Mm, yep. All right, you can everybody see that? Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. Uh, so I don't need to tell anybody here that unobserved confounding is a foundational problem in causal inference. So we often have settings where we'd like to learn the effects of potentially many treatments A on some outcome Y, but where inferences are contaminated by the presence of some unobserved confounder Z that affects both the treatments and the outcome. Uh, recently, uh, there's been a, a quite a prominent proposal for addressing this issue. So those of you who attended the seminar just a couple weeks ago and saw Dave Bly's talk will be familiar with uh, an approach, a, a family of estimators that's called the deconfounder. So at a very high level, this is an approach for using factor models to conduct some dimension reduction of A to estimate uh, some factor model scores, which are referred to as substitute confounders, uh, an estimate of the confounder. And, and then to use that information to improve a regression of the outcome on the treatment and the substitute confounder. So this is an approach that at this point is fairly widely used in a number of applied domains uh, and has seen a, a fairly prominent discussion in a, a series of papers that, that have circulated widely. Uh, the basic intuition behind this approach is that even though we can't directly observe this confounder, uh, it, it's hoped that by looking at the patterns and the way that these treatments move together, the way that A1 and A2 and so on, the way that they, they tend to, um, to, to be perturbed in, in predictable ways, we can look at those patterns and how they're perturbed uh, and use that information to effectively back out what the value of that confounder uh, would be, and then use that information to improve our, our causal inference. It's the basic logic of the deconfounder. Uh, it's an approach that's, that's said to be uh, much better than the traditional alternative or, or what people did before the deconfounder came around, uh, which is just to you know, basically pretend that confounding doesn't exist, to ignore the presence of this unobserved v, a z, and naively uh, regress the outcome on the contaminated treatments only. So this is widely described as, as a naive approach to causal inference because we know that there's this confounding. Uh, and so that's why my, my collaborators and I were so surprised when we began this project to examine the empirical behavior, the properties uh, of, these, uh, of these estimators uh, in this multiple causal, in this confounded multiple cause setting. So just at a very high level to summarize the results, what we did was we went through and we analyzed the properties, we derived the properties of every variant deconfounder estimator that's ever been proposed in any of the deconfounder papers. And there are a surprising number of them. And what we found is that some of them just don't work in the sense that uh, they can't be computed. Uh, they're not estimable. Others uh, require strong additional unstated assumptions to achieve uh, consistent causal estimates. Uh, but most importantly, uh, from a theoretical perspective, none of them provide value added in the sense that they achieve consistent estimates where naive regression does not. Uh, from a practical, from an empirical perspective, we replicated uh, every simulation and empirical application in every decompounder paper. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm only going to talk about the results highlighted in red here. Uh, and again, we found that there's simply, uh, from you know, practically speaking, there's no practical value added either um, 
uh, you know, uh, in an empirical, from an empirical perspective. Uh, so just to step back, uh, so this general strategy uh, of the Deacon Founder, or more generally using factor models to try to improve causal inference, uh, is a strategy that's seen widely in fields ranging from genetics to social science. And uh, of course, it takes a lot of assumptions and, and conditions to make a method like this go. There's been a lot of work, uh, including by our discussants, Betsy, Ilya, and Eric, to really figure out exactly what those technical conditions are. A lot of them aren't, aren't uh, immediately obvious. Uh, and I'm not going to get into these um, into this work today. Uh, the main thing that we'll need for our purposes is we're going to assume that the A's of the treatments are generated according to a factor model. Right, but uh, to, uh, for for a more extensive discussion of the technical points, I'd point you to to some of this other work. Uh, we're really going to approach this problem from a much more practical and pragmatic perspective, which is uh, does the decompounder work, uh, and and how well does it work, and what kind of value added does it provide for an applied researcher? And from our perspective, it seems that there's something uh, a bit strange um, right off the bat, uh, because the, the entire idea of the Deacon founder, uh, it hinges on this idea of a substitute founder that we can estimate from the observed data. Right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our observed treatments and run them through a factor model and get out some output that's our best guess of the, uh, of the unobserved confounder given the observed data that we have. Now what the Deacon founder is gonna do is take that information and use it, to learn a conditional expectation function of the outcome given the treatment and this substitute confounder, which we can rewrite as a conditional expectation of the outcome given the treatment and a function uh, of that treatment, which of course simplifies further to this. And, and what this expression here says is that what the Deacon founder is learning uh, is exactly the same as what a naive regression is learning, which is the expectation of the outcome given only the observed data. So right off the bat, uh, the first thing that jumps out is that if we're doing this right, if we're doing this in a totally flexible way, uh, then as data grows large, uh, we should be getting the same answer from these two approaches. And in fact, that's exactly uh, what, what we'll find. And it's a point that I'll return to over and over today. Uh, there has been a number, uh, there's been a, quite a bit of prior work on the founder, uh, mostly coming at it, again, from this theoretical perspective. So uh, commentators, including our discussants, uh, Jim Moore, um, people like Amaya and Jack have pointed out a number of issues like general impossibility results, uh, the fact that if the Deacon founder were to work, it would re require infinite dimensional data, a uh, number of unstated assumptions and some definitional issues. But really, we're, we're not going to be talking about this stuff today. We're just going to focus uh, from a purely practical perspective. Um, how well does the Deacon founder work and does it provide practical value added for the applied researcher? The takeaway from all this if you remember nothing else from this talk, uh, just remember that, um, you know, in principle, what we find is that the Deacon powder can work. Uh, it can provide uh, consistent causal inferences uh, under certain very strong assumptions uh, and very restrictive conditions. But unfortunately, there's just no practical way to make use of that interesting fact for applied research. And that's not just because the conditions uh, for it to work are so stringent. It's also because, as I'll show you, if those stringent conditions were satisfied, uh, we could simply just run a naive regression and also uh, get the same results. Uh, so before I dive in um, to, to the real meat of our talk, uh, I'm first going to start with a, a very simple toy setting, uh, something that we call the linear linear case. Again, so this is a, a very simple sort of place where we're going to build up intuition and then generalize that to more interesting estimators than one GBGP. The reason we call it the linear linear setting is because we're working with a linear factor model. This is a probabilistic PCA where we generate our unobserved confounders V, and then we generate our observed treatments by taking those confounders and running through some factor loading data. Then uh, we take the treatments and the confounder, and we run it through a linear outcome model where the treatments have some treatment effects beta, and the confounders have some confounder effects gamma, and those together generate the outcome Y. Uh, we're going to use this. We're going to use this setting to examine the behavior of a few different uh, competing estimators, and then scale up and, and go to more, uh, like some more interesting results. Now, one conceptual issue that's going to arise is that um, in this setting, uh, none of the estimators that we examine are going to be consistent uh, for any continuous DGP uh, with a finite number of treatments. So this is, is actually on theorem two. Uh, and so, instead, the general flavor of the results that I'm going to present to you are about asymptotics for a sequence of and what I mean by that is when we talk about a sequence of DGPs, we're going to hold fixed the number of confounders, so those Zs there, uh, we're going to hold fixed the dimension of Z, 
and we're going to add on an increasing number of treatments. Specifically, what I mean by add on treatments is we're going to say, um, when I add a new treatment, I'm going to take all of my old treatments, the first M of them, and I'm going to hold fix their factor loading, the way that they relate to the unobserved confounders. And then this new treatment is going to load on to those same old confounders in this new way, governed by this parameter. Uh, similarly, when I add on a new treatment, I'm going to hold fix the treatment effects of all the old treatments, and then this new treatment is going to have its own effect on the outcome that's governed by this new parameter. And so the question that we're going to ask is, as we add on more and more treatments, as the number of treatments approaches infinity, does the estimator get closer and closer to, to consistency? And what we find is that across the board, for any of these estimators to work in this setting, we're going to require a condition called strong infinite confounding, uh, which just informally means that every confounder has to confound a lot of treatments a lot. And so in the linear linear case, uh, what that means is that these factor loadings, again, that determine how strongly the treatments relate to the confounders. Uh, for each confounder, we're going to need the sum of its squared factor loading to go to infinity as the number of treatments goes to infinity. Uh, there is a generalization of this for not the nonlinear case, but, but it doesn't provide a lot of useful intuition, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about it much. So with all of these tools in hand, we're now able to, to examine the properties of, of our first estimator. So I'm going to start by examining a naive regression. And I should clarify here, uh, just to formalize things, that when I say a naive regression, what I mean is uh, any estimator in the broad class of estimators that analyzes the outcome directly in terms of the treatment, ignoring the presence of this unobserved confounder. So this is in contrast to uh, the family of estimators of the deconfounder, which tries to directly target and adjust for this unobserved confounder. So for example, one naive regression is just a, a linear regression that takes the outcome and regresses it on the observed treatments, again, ignoring the presence of this unobserved Z. It's pretty straightforward to derive the properties uh, of, that, of that estimator. So we can see that uh, there's some omitted variable, uh, the unobserved Z, and the severity of the bias uh, in, of this estimator is governed by how strongly those omitted confounders relate to the outcome, the uh, confounder effect gamma, uh, how strongly they correlate with the treatment, factor loading theta, and then some adjustment for how the, the treatments correlate with each other because they come out of the same factor model. And so right off the bat, we can see that the naive regression is not, in general, a consistent estimator uh, with confounding, which of course makes sense. But what we can show is that as long as strong infinite confounding is satisfied, as the number of treatments grows larger and larger, the naive estimator asymptotically approaches consistency. And that, again, is just coming from the definition of SIC in the linear linear case. This, the diagonal of this term goes to infinity and swamps this term, and the whole thing goes to zero. Uh, so now we're able to turn to uh, our first decompounder estimator. So this is an approach that's proposed by, by Wang and Bly in, in their JASA paper um, uh, that, we, that we refer to as the full decompounder. And the way this is going to work is we're going to take our observed treatments, A, and we're going to run them through a principal component analysis. Extract the first K principal component, Z hat, or our substitute confounders, and then we're going to control for them in a regression of the outcome on the observed treatment and the principal component. Now, the first thing that you'll notice here is that this doesn't work. You can't actually run this regression. And that's because the uh, substitute confounders are nothing more than a linear projection of the treatment. We have perfect collinearity here. Now, that collinearity is not actually the, the, re the real problem. It's not the root cause of the issue. It's really just a symptom. Uh, the root cause of the problem is that the, the, this linear projection contains no new information that would allow the analyst to do causal inference. And so that manifests as collinearity uh, and its inability to actually run the regression. Uh, and all the other estimators that I'm going to talk about that I just referred to are, are really just kind of ad hoc fixes for this, for this collinearity issue, this no new information issue. So for example, I'll talk about the subset deconfounder now. The subset deconfounder is, a, is, a, is another version of the deconfounder. Um, that, that works as follows. Uh, this is also proposed by, by Wang and Bly in their JASA paper, but this is uh, generalized, this is sort of a very similar in spirit to the genetics estimator of Price et al. So as before, we're going to use principal component analysis to obtain some, uh, some PCs of, of our gene matrix. Uh, we're going to interpret this as collectively representing our best estimate of a person's uh, ancestry. And then we're going to take our genes and divide them into two groups. Uh, a set of focal genes, uh, for example, or maybe just one gene that we really care about that we're trying to estimate the effects of, and then a set of non-focal genes, which are really just everything else 
that, that we don't care about. And conceptually, when we talk about a growing sequence of VGPs, we're always going to imagine holding space for focal genes and then adding on more and more non-focal genes that we don't really care about. And so the subset decompounder takes the regression, uh, does a regression of the outcome on the focal gene or genes uh, and these ancestry principal components. Uh, and the reason that it can run is as long as we're dropping more than K non-focal genes, then we avoid the, the, non the, the collinearity problem. Now, conceptually, there's going to be two, there's going to be uh, uh, an issue that arises, which is that we're excluding all of these non-focal genes from the regression. And that's going to cause problems. If we actually knew the true value of the confounder, it wouldn't cause problems. Because, of course, uh, any pair of treatments, the non-focal treatments and, and, uh, and the focal treatments, would be conditionally independent of each other, uh, given the true factor model score, the true confounder. But unfortunately, we don't actually have that true confounder. All we have is this numerically estimated uh, approximation of that true confounder. And so in general, it's not going to be the case that the non-focal genes are independent of the focal genes. Uh, and so omitting them from the regression is going to cause problems. And specifically, we're going to have a race uh, between two competing phenomena. On the one hand, as we add on more and more non-focal genes, we're going to get better and better estimates of ancestry. So this z-hat is going to get closer and closer to z. We're going to come closer and closer to satisfying this condition that would allow us to do clean causal inference. But on the other hand, as we add on more and more non-focal genes, all of those genes have their own effects on the outcome. So the, the bias that comes from emitting each individual gene gets smaller, but you're aggregating that smaller bias over a larger number of genes. And so we have this rate. Again, we can derive the properties of this, uh, of this procedure. Uh, it's a little bit messy, but I'll, I'll just walk through this in a second for you. And what we can show is that as the number of treatments grows large, if certain conditions are satisfied, uh, then the subset decompounder can also achieve asymptotic consistency. But these conditions are going to be stronger than the ones that I just showed you for, uh, for the naive regression. Here, uh, just to interpret those for you, here are, the, here are three conditions. So one way that this bias term could go to zero is if this term right here were zero. And so what that would mean is that the non-focal genes, uh, that the focal genes are unrelated to the confounder. But again, if we were willing to assume that from the beginning, we could have just run a naive regression and saved ourselves a lot of work. The second way that this bias term can go to zero is if this term uh, is zero. And so if you look at this, what's going on is that each of these non-focal genes has some effect on the outcome, uh, and it also relates to the unobserved confounders. And so those two things multiplied together uh, for each non-focal gene is the omitted variable bias uh, from leaving it out. And so it could be the case you know, by pure chance that as we have a bunch of non-focal genes, some of them have positive omitted variable bias, some of them have negative omitted variable bias, and we might hope that somehow these things magically add up just to zero. And in fact, that kind of accidental bias cancellation is something that people have suggested uh, can be used in applied research. Um, but I think in general, it's just not a very reliable way to, to do analysis. Um, so we're, we're, it's not going to be particularly useful for us. The third way that we can achieve uh, asymptotically consistent uh, results from the uh, estimates from the subset decompounder is if this entire term here goes to zero. And just to interpret that for you, one way that that can happen is if our later treatments, as we add on more and more genes, the later ones have weaker and weaker effects. And so what that means is that past a certain point, you're basically just adding proxy variables that don't affect the outcome, but are still telling you something about ancestry. And intuitively, it makes sense that that would work uh, just from what we know from, for example, Eric's work on proximal inference. But the important thing, the important, important point that I want to make here is that all of these assumptions are about the very phenomenon that we're trying to study. In order to learn about uh, uh, causal effects from the subset decompounder, we need to be willing to make assumptions about causal effects uh, to begin with. And that's something that, that many analysts, I think, might not be comfortable with. It, again, it just completely depends on the setting. There are a number of other variant estimators um, uh, of the Deacon founder. I'm not going to get into the weeds here, uh, but basically they're all various approaches that try to break this collinearity, this no new information problem by, for example, uh, adding random noise to the principal component. Some of them work uh, in that they can achieve asymptotically consistent causal estimates. Uh, uh, others don't work. Uh, to the extent that they do work, it's really because, uh, it's not because of any value added from the machinery of the Deacon founder. It's because these approaches uh, uh, contain, they nest as naive regression inside them. And the naive regression actually does the heavy lifting that gets the asymptotic consistency. So you might ask at this point, uh, presented a bunch of results. Um, 
how much of this intuition actually carries over? And the answer is, uh, it turns out all of it. So to show you that, I'm first going to examine a very simple nonlinear case, probably the most simple nonlinear case that you can imagine. Um, and that's just because in the interest of time, this is the easiest one to present. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have constant additive treatment effects uh, and, um, and linearly separable, additively separable confounding function. Okay, and so this is our conditional expectation uh, in the outcome model. And just, let's just unpack this a bit. So we can rewrite this in terms of an orthogonal polynomial expansion. So again, we have our treatment effects here. We have this term here, which represents the linear trend in the confounding function. So as the confounder increases, what's the linear trend in the conditional expectation? And then we have this term here, which represents all the higher order terms, the squares, the interactions, and so on between our confounders. And nothing has changed here. I've just re-expressed the, the same, the same um, uh, CEF. Now, to understand uh, why nonlinearity doesn't save us from the issues that I just pointed out, uh, we're going to propose and then evaluate an estimator that turns out is a nice generalization of the ridge deconfounder that, that's used in a lot of prior work. So again, as before, we're going to run a principal component analysis to extract some principal components, and then we're going to do the plug-in analog of computing the squares and the interactions and so on of those estimated principal components. We run a ridge regression of the outcome on the treatments, the substitute confounder, and its higher order terms. Uh, I'm not going to go through the derivation, but at a high level, what we find is that all of this curvature and this higher order wiggliness in the conditional expectation function doesn't contaminate our causal inferences, which might be surprising. But the intuition behind that is, uh, by construction, these higher order terms are orthogonal to the, the linear, the, the confounder. And the confounder itself is, is a, a noisy linear projection of the treatment. Right? So this, this basically doesn't uh, doesn't cause any problems for our inference on the treatment effects data. But this term here, the linear trend in the confounding function, that does contaminate our causal inference. And intuitively, that's because uh, the only thing that the estimator has to seize on to learn this term, this confounder effect, it doesn't actually have the true z. All it has is the linear projection of the a's. And so the estimator is always going to be able to take some of this true treatment effect and slide it over to the confounder by doing just the right you know, by doing just the right um, uh, the the hat by doing just the right projection of the uh, uh, of the observed estimation, and it turns out that that uh, intuition also generalizes very well. If you have a totally flexible factor model, uh, for example, if you have some neural network embedding model, and you have some totally flexible outcome model. That estimator is always going to be able to produce equivalently uh, equivalently good predictions if it takes some of the treatment and slides it, transforms it into some estimated confounder and then take some of the treatment effect and correspondingly slides it over to the confounder effect. You're always going to be able to produce identical uh, prediction accuracy. And so the only thing that helps you disentangle those two phenomena to arbitrate between those things is regularization, which again isn't uh, typically going to provide um, good inference. So that's a, that's a negative result. Okay, so that's a result that talks about why the deconfounder is not going to work. But I want to pivot now and, and talk about a more you know, come at this from a more positive angle. So suppose that the deconfounder did work. This is going to be the second and last theoretical result that I'll present today. Suppose that it did work. Okay, so what, what does that tell us? What is the fact that the deconfounder can provide a consistent causal estimate? What does that tell us about the deconfounder? Does that tell us that it's an effective estimator? Or is, does that tell us that maybe the setting that we're examining, there's something easier about it? And it turns out that the answer is uh, that if the deconfounder works, it tells us that the setting is easy. This is our theorem one. Uh, it says that informally, if the deconfounder is consistent in a broad class uh, of continuous uh, DGPs, um, it's consistent because it converges to a naive estimator. So, and so to unpack that a little bit, let's again imagine that we have uh, our treatments and we're going to partition them again into some focal treatments that we care about and then a bunch of other non focal treatments. So, just a few preliminaries. Uh, if the deconfounder works, that implies uh, a couple things. It implies that, first of all, that we're able to do what's called pinpointing. In other words, we're able to back out the true value of the confounder uh, or something equivalent to it um, using only a function of the observed data. Okay. The second thing that it implies is that we have an infinite number of treatments because without uh, infinite stochastic you know, noisy treatments, we would not be able to, to do to accomplish that pinpointing. So we put these two things together. What that says is that if we're able to pinpoint with an infinite number of all treatments, 
then we must also be able to pinpoint with an infinite number of non-focal treatments. We just take the infinite number and we subtract away a finite number of focal treatments, and we still have basically the same amount of information. Right? Now we can turn back to our conditional expectation function, some function that is additively separable of the uh, focal treatments, the non-focal treatments, and the confounder. And what this tells us here is that we can rewrite this confounder term in terms of, uh, and, and get exactly the same thing using only the non-focal treatment. We can pinpoint the confounder using the non-focal treatment, which means that these last two terms can be rewritten as only a function of the non-focal treatment. And this immediately suggests uh, a naive estimator that, that has no reference, that doesn't target the, the unobserved confounder in any way. You take your outcome, you run a regression only on the non-focal treatment, you residualize them. Uh, what that model learns and what it eats is a, a, a composite of the non-focal treatment effects and this confounding. And what you're left with, you regress the residuals on only the focal treatments in as flexible way, a way as you want, and you will unbiasedly recover um, the, the, the quantity of interest, the, the, the causal effect on the focal subset. And that's without loss of generality because it's a new cycle. Uh, so I'll stop here. That's uh, the end of our empirical, uh, sorry, the end of our theoretical results. I'll take some questions here and um, uh, before we move on to our simulation. Um, so the, the, there aren't any questions at the moment. So um, maybe you can continue and then we'll keep some time at the end if there are, um, if, if some pop up um, then. Sure. So um, I, I guess one question, you know, this is sort of to anticipate, but one question that we often get when we present the empirical results is, um, so as, as you'll see, our, our conclusions are uh, diverged quite a bit from the decompounder papers. Um, and so people ask why, why is, why is that? You know, ostensibly, we're running the same estimators. Uh, we're using the exact same simulation setups. How can we draw a completely different conclusion? Um, how can we draw a much more pessimistic conclusion? Um, and honestly, it's kind of hard to say because a lot of the results in those papers don't replicate. Uh, but at a very high level, I think there are three main reasons for the divergence in these results. Uh, the first is these collinearity, these collinearity issues and, and, and a number of other issues that uh, result in pretty extreme numerical instability. And so what that means is that in, the, in these simulations, uh, the results depend a lot on what random seed is chosen. Uh, and so that's why we, uh, when we present our results, all the links that you saw earlier, those are links to uh, publicly posted, independently verified uh, code ocean modules. So just guaranteed the results come from uh, the code that we ran. And they're easily extended and probed by third parties. If you want to just open it up and tweak the simulation, you can do that as you see fit. Um, the second reason, uh, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, so when we do these simulations, we, we correct a number of uh, serious technical errors that I don't really want to get into here, but uh, we can discuss further on, offline. And, and the last reason, uh, as you'll see in a second, when we present our results, we present them in their entirety uh, rather than just selecting a, a few to discuss. Right? So the, what I mean by that will become clear. Uh, so our first simulation, I'm only going to present two today, uh, two applications. Uh, the first is taken from a tutorial that was designed to teach readers how to use the decompounder, how the decompounder works. So this is a very simple simulation DGP uh, where we have our unobserved confounder and our two treatments that are drawn from a multivariate normal. That's uh, one on the diagonal and then has some, not, uh, some off diagonal entries that I'll call row. We're going to take these things after we, after we generate them and run them through an outcome model. The only thing that's, uh, that's unusual about this outcome model is that these, uh, these terms don't enter linearly, they enter as quadratic. So we square the first treatment, we square the second treatment, we square the confounder, we multiply them by their coefficients, and then, and then we draw our, uh, our outcome with noise. Um, we're going to evaluate, we're going to start by evaluating two estimators that are taken, again, directly from the tutorial. The first is a deconfounder, where we, as usual, run a principal component analysis, extract a substitute confounder. And then we're going to square the first treatment, square the second treatment, and square the substitute confounder. And so the whole premise of this simulation is that we know the correct functional form of the outcome model. It's just that we don't know the true z, so we're going to plug in the z hat instead of z. Okay? The second one is a naive estimator uh, where we just regress y on the squared treatment. And what we find uh, in this simulation, uh, so on the y-axis here, I have a basically mean squared error. And what we find, it, or what we saw in the original results, is that when rho takes on the value of, of 0 0.4 is the only value examined uh, in that simulation, the, the naive estimator does much worse. This blue square is higher 
uh, it has much larger mean squared error than the deep founder of this red dot, um, which has better, so it appears to have better properties. And so the first question that we asked ourselves is, well, what happens if we just tweak this uh, just a tiny bit? And instead of plugging in 0 0.4 for rho, what if we plug in negative 0.4, a, a seemingly innocuous change? And what we found was the exact opposite of the original results. Uh, the deep founder now suddenly has uh, Far, far larger mean squared error, a worse performance than the naive estimator. And in fact, if you examine a range of possible values, uh, uh, of possible parameter values in this space, what we find is everything to the left of here, uh, the, uh, the naive regression outperforms the deep confounder in that it has uh, much lower mean squared error, right? in contrast to the original impression that we got when we only examined uh, this part of the parameter space. Um, the second question that we asked ourselves is, well, you know, if you look at this, if you look at this outcome model, right? So the Deacon founder has some information about the functional form of this outcome model that we didn't really use in our naive regression. And if you think about, and you just uh, expand out this Z, what it does is it contains some information about the, the joint values of A1 and A2, which of course are correlated. And so we just wrote down an alternative naive estimator that again, makes no reference to, to targeting Z or estimating Z hat and controlling for it. We just uh, wrote a slightly richer naive estimator that controls for the squares of the treatments and their interactions. And what we find is that, uh, again, this is just based on the premise of the simulation, which is that the analyst knows the outcome model functional form. And what we found is that across the parameter space, this second naive uh, estimator um, uh, dominates uh, weekly. So, you know, it has basically like no you know, squared error relative. It is very close to the oracle, uh, depending on how large N is. Um, so uh, these are all new results, uh, the X is these. Uh, so I'll just wrap up the, the quadratic here. I'm happy to talk about it more in Q and A. And I'll pivot now to the actor application. So this is our last result. Um, the uh, the setup is taken directly from uh, the, the the JASA paper, the Long and Block paper. And so the setup is that we have a, a data set of movies. Each of them earns some revenue, and we'd like to understand how an actor's Casting, so a binary indicator of whether like Tom Cruise appeared in a movie, uh, um, positively affected its, its taking at, at the box office. So basically, if I have an art, you know, a student art film, and I talk Tom Cruise into appearing in my film, how much will my revenue go up? And of course, there are going to be a number of compounders, like um, uh, like what the, like whether it's an action movie, how much money I have to make my art film, if I'm a good director, and so on. There are a number of uh, conceptual issues with this causal question that we're basically going to ignore completely. The, the empirics looks like this. Well, if we're going to take log revenue and we're going to regress it on the binary actor indicators, along with, uh, because we don't have the true confounders like budget, uh, or, well, we have them, but we're just going to set them aside. Uh, because we don't have these confounders, we're instead going to regress on um, some substitute confounders that we extract from post matrix factorization of the actor matrix and then run OLS. And we can interpret the causal, the coefficients that come out of this procedure as estimates of a multiplicative causal effect on revenue. So if I cast Tom Cruise, he will quintuple my, my revenue. Uh, here are the results that we found. Uh, I want to emphasize that we, um, uh, uh, Wang and I were kind enough to provide the, the exact cash output of the factor model run. So, so these are exactly the results. Um, we have access to the same results. Uh, the, the red highlights are um, results that were discussed in, in the original paper. Um, and this coefficients here are how much you know Will Smith will will quadruple your your revenue. So you'll see that the top uh, that the top the most lucrative actor if you cast them is estimated to be Stanley. Uh, to show you what Stanley's performance looks like, I prepared a clip. This is from uh, Thor, and so this, the as background, what's happened is uh, Thor's hammer has just fallen from the heavens, and mortals are competing to try to budge the, the hammer to see if they're worthy. Okay, take a look. Uh, so at the very end there, Stanley appeared. Uh, it did not, in fact, work. He was not able to budge the hammer. Um, but uh, but that, that was really the extent of his appearance in that movie. So Stanley, some of you may know, is uh, a very famous comic book writer who made short cameos in, in every Marvel Cinematic Universe movie that was ever made, um, uh, just totaling just a, a few minutes in screen time. But the estimates that come out of the full Deacon Founder 
uh, which we're able to estimate this, this, you know, this some place in the estimation. That's why we're able to run that. Uh, but uh, the Soil Beacon founder suggests that Stan Lee's few seconds of screen time contributed in total uh, 15 billion in MCU revenue, which is the vast majority of taking, uh, you know, which again is, is just kind of facially impossible. Similarly, the number two actor, John Ratzenberger, you probably don't know him. Uh, he is a voice actor that appeared in every Pixar movie, starting from Toy Story. Uh, we can do the same analysis for the subset Deacon Founder, and we see uh, you know, similarly very large uh, causal estimates uh, for Jess Harnell and Ava Akers. Uh, Jess Harnell was, uh, he's a, again, a voice actor who you may recognize from Transformers. He was the voice of the Autobot Ironhide. And Ava Akers was, uh, sort of played Steve Jobs' daughter. She was a child actor. So I think facially, uh, it seems that we can tell stories. We don't have the ground truth, but we can tell stories about how probably some of these results are driven mostly by confounding, which suggests to me in, uh, informally that even though we have fairly rich data, almost 1,000 treatment dimensions and 3,000 observations, um, which is fairly large by social science standards, um, that, that SIC, strong infinite confounding, is, is a very difficult condition to satisfy, even approximately. So instead, what we advocate is uh, actually going out and measuring confounders, known confounders like budget, and controlling for them. And uh, what we can see is when we do that, a lot of these facially implausible results like Stan Lee and, and, and Jeff Harnell, they go away. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that these are clean causal estimates, but at least it looks like we've addressed you know, some of the issues, perhaps. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up here at, at a very high level. Um, uh, I'll say that the main takeaway from our, from our paper is that theoretically, uh, there's we don't seem to find a value added from the Deacon founder. In fact, we find that there cannot be a value added from the Deacon founder and that it cannot provide consistent causal estimates uh, anywhere that a naive regression cannot. Um, that's not to say the naive regression is good. Uh, we show that both methods are inconsistent in all real data applications, i.e. where we have a finite uh, dimensional uh, treatments. Um, and even in finite samples, uh, we, we looked very hard, uh, replicated, so there's just an astronomical amount of code in this um, in this project. Uh, we looked very hard. Uh, we found no evidence of improved finite sample performance, uh, and that includes a number of improvements that we that we made to both the estimation and evaluation of both of these approaches. Um, most importantly, I think a priori, uh, as an analyst, uh, just from a practical perspective, we have no ability to predict in any particular setting which one is going to be better for the task at hand, which kind of depends on where you are in the parameter space. Uh, but we do know that the Deacon founder brings with it extra complexity and, uh, and a certain measure of non-transparency non and numerical instability. And so if you force me to choose a priori, I would probably suggest going with a naive regression. But ultimately, I, I think neither of these are a solution for, uh, for causal inference under confounding. We really just, there's no substitute for putting in the shoe leather, for going out and finding the instrumental variables, finding the regression discontinuities, finding the proxy variables. And doing, you know, just kind of the, the tried and true, um, you know, work to, to improve cosmic things. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll turn it over to Justin for q and Actually, I'll, I think we have Justin first. All right. Uh, thanks, Dean. Um, so we're now going to switch over to the discussion. So we'll have uh, Betsy Ockburn present some slides. And then after that, uh, we can... Uh, can have some more discussion if there are any questions. Uh, Betsy, switching over to you. Great. Um, can you hear me and see my slides? Yes. Okay. So um, thanks so much to Dean and Justin and Brandon for the um, talk and paper. And thanks to the organizers for giving us a chance to discuss this work. Um, so as this talk showed, estimation using the two-stage deconfounder approach is more complicated than, but can underperform the naive regression that you'd run if you just didn't think there was any unmeasured confounding, or if you decided to ignore it. This is a really crucial point that had been overlooked in all of the earlier discussions about the deconfounder, um, and in particular, it suggests that any two-stage procedure for dealing with unmeasured confounding must be compared to naive regression. And that, that's a, the kind of baseline against which uh, everything, um, against which it, it might be hard to um, outperform. So uh, Dean is correct that most of the discussion around the deconfounder to date has been about the theory. 
And that's in fact what I'm going to, again, focus on today, but I'll try not to get into the weeds and rather just to make some very high level points about potential pitfalls that are really easy to fall into when developing new methods to deal with unmeasured confounding. The reason that um, Eric and Ilya and I feel that it's important to harp on these pitfalls, um, and this is also the reason that, um, that Justin, Dean, and Brandon's paper is so important is because we've seen a flurry of papers that build upon the deconfounder or that recommend using it in practice. And um, this can be really dangerous if, if researchers are drawing substantive conclusions that are substantive causal conclusions that are unwarranted and maybe basing um, policy or medical treatment decisions on those unwarranted causal conclusions. Um, the deconfounder builds off of a rich and very highly successful tradition of two-stage latent variable estimation procedures um, that are commonly used in statistical genetics and computational biology. So these are methods like RUV, LEAP, and Eigenstrat, all of which estimate an unmeasured confounder using data from multiple observed treatments and then control for that estimated confounder in an outcome regression. These methods all rely either explicitly or implicitly both on strong parametric models and also on the existence of um, many negative controls or null treatments. The, the purported motivation for the deconfounder was to develop a non-parametric version of these methods um, and a, a version that could be applied to applications beyond statistical genetics and comp bio. Um, and one that would be on rigorous causal footing. We are in um, total agreement that work remains to be done to put these popular statistical genetics and comp bio methods on rigorous causal footing. Um, I'm not sure that there's any broad consensus throughout the data sciences about what constitutes a rigorous causal justification. So we thought we would take this opportunity to stake our claim for um, what constitutes a rigorous causal justification. So first of all, what separates causal from statistical inference is the identification of causal effects from observed data. A causal justification is one that maps a causal estimate of interest onto a functional of the observed data and we claim that it should adhere to these principles or follow these steps. So first, it should define the estimates of interest non-parametrically and in terms of potential outcomes or counterfactuals. So not in terms of the observed outcome and observed treatment and not in terms of a model for the observed data. Second, it should propose transparent and accessible and accessible assumptions, assumptions that can either be understood and assessed by subject matter experts and practitioners or assumptions that are as mathematically unrestrictive as possible, non-parametric as possible, or preferably both. <laughs> Third, and perhaps most importantly, um, it should communicate these assumptions as clearly as possible and indicate when they might hold or when they might be violated and how practitioners can assess when they might hold and when they might be violated. This is crucial because as we all know, um, causal inference relies on untestable assumptions and assessing when those assumptions might hold is the only way to delineate when a method can provide reliable results and when it should not be used. And then finally, um, it should rigorously prove either point or partial identification under the assumptions. That is, use the assumptions to map the causal estimates onto a functional or a region of the observed data. When the causal problem at hand is identifying causal effects in the presence of unmeasured confounding, assumptions play a really outsized role. And that's because the presence of an unmeasured confounder, just, just the mere presence of an unmeasured confounder imposes no restrictions on the observed data. So any method that uses observed data to learn anything about the unmeasured confounder is relying on untestable, generally parametric assumptions about the relationship between the unobserved confounder and the observed data. This is really different from, for example, the no unmeasured confounding assumption, which is also untestable, but is not parametric and can be much easier to reason about. Um, this might be okay relying on, on untestable assumptions that link the, 
that parameterize the relationship between the unmeasured confounder and the observed data might be okay if we have incredibly strong domain specific knowledge about that relationship, the relationship between the unmeasured confounder and the observed data. But in general, this kind of has the, the flavor of assuming a consequent. If we want to estimate an unmeasured confounder from observed data, we first have to assume that the unmeasured confounder is estimable from the observed data. And if we want to use a particular kind of model to estimate the unmeasured confounder, we have to make the untestable assumption that the unmeasured confounder was generated from that very model. So what's important here is that we're making a parametric assumption about unobserved variables into, in order to identify them. Um, and that's what makes the, the parametric assumptions untestable and, and quite different from the way that parametric models are usually used in estimation, which is for the observed data. Um, the, the version of the deconfounder that Dave presented two weeks ago assumes that the unmeasured confounder is distributed according to a factor model on the causes and then uses a factor model on the causes to estimate the unmeasured confounder. But if somebody had chosen to assume that the unmeasured confounder was distributed according to some other kind of model, then that's the model that would have been licensed. Um, and the observed data can't adjudicate between different choices of models. So the model has to either be pulled out of thin air or justified a priori with subject matter knowledge. Okay, so uh, then why do these methods, which often in practice do rely on factor or other latent var variable models, work so well in GWAS and um, other CompBio applications? All of the applications for which these methods are kind of tried and true and used um, very commonly in practice and have been validated share two um, crucial features. The first is that the confounder is a dependence structure that's shared by all of the multiple treatments. So for example, family or population structure in, um, that's shared by every SNP in GWAS, where um, confounding is by either cryptic relatedness or population stratification, um, or a batch or clustering indicator that's shared by every treatment um, in CompBio applications with confounding by batch effects. Um, and then the second really important feature is that it's known that many effects will be null and um, this allows them to be used as, as null proxies or negative controls. So in effect, um, the way that these methods work, RUV, LEAP, Eigenstrat and others, is that um, the null treatments are used to identify the common dependent structure, which can then be used to identify treatment effects and often treatment effects for only one or a small number of treatments at a time are, are of interest. Um, researchers in these settings have enough a priori understanding of how, for example, family or population structure or batch structure works that it's pretty safe to assume parametric latent variable models relating the unobserved structure to the observed treatments. We conjecture that unlike the deconfounder settings that Dean talked about, the two-stage procedures that are, are used so popularly in GWAS and CompBio might actually be advantageous and, and work pretty well when um, the identification strategy relies on the existence of negative controls or null treatments, which is not the case for the deconfounder. Um, and also when strong domain knowledge about structure, for example, family population or batch structure is built into the first stage procedure. Um, but one of the most exciting claims of the deconfounder was that these methods could in fact be used outside of the GWAS and CompBio settings where they're already widely used. Um, but I, I can't think of another setting where we have enough a priori knowledge to correctly postulate a model for the relationship between the unmeasured confounder and the observed data. So certainly in um, electronic medical records and other health applications where um, the, the canonical confounders are things like health seeking behavior or underlying frailty, it's hard to imagine that even really savvy doctors or health experts know how to parametrically model the relationship between these unmeasured confounders and observed treatments. The same holds for settings where confounding might be due to self-selection into treatment. I, I can't think of an instance where 
the unobserved determinants of self-selection could be accurately pinned down to a parametric relationship with the observed treatments. To put this another way, for most unmeasured confounders, and certainly most unmeasured confounders in the health and social sciences, we have no reason to believe that they restrict the observed data at all, let alone in a specific identifiable or estimable way. And in many settings, we can't even list the confounders. There are lots of settings where um, researchers are willing to say, we don't think we've collected all the confounders. We think there's some residual unmeasured confounding, but we're not sure exactly by what. And if we can't even list the confounders, then we, we probably have no hope of identifying the relationship between these unnamed confounders and the observed data. So I'll just close with some related work that um, provides rigorous causal justification for the identification of causal effects in the presence of unmeasured confounding, though not necessarily um, in the multiple treatment setting. Um, and the first thing to note is that all of the work that goes beyond GWAS and comp bio applications relies on auxiliary data. And in fact, the as um, Dean pointed out, the, the negative control aspect of even the GWAS and Compio applications, the fact that um, we assume that most of the treatments or many of the treatments are null, can be seen as a version of auxiliary data. Um, so, you know, one conclusion that we can draw is that we probably are going to need auxiliary data in order to, to get anything done in the presence of unmeasured confounding. Um, so, in their discussions of the original deconfounder paper in JASA, Alex Damore and Imai and Jiang pointed out that proxy and instrumental variable methods are really principled approaches that we could use in this multi-treatment setting and that future work should be done um, in that direction. Eric and many co-authors have a growing body of work on proximal learning, which is a, a new framework for harnessing proxy variables to deal with unmeasured confounding. And then in a paper that we just you know, eked onto archive yesterday, Wang, Miao, and co-authors, including me, have extended proximal learning to precisely the multi-treatment setting considered by the deconfounder. And this patches up the remaining gaps in the deconfounder theory. And with that, um, thanks again to the organizers and to um, Dean, Justin, and Brandon. Thank you, Betsy. Um, so um, let me maybe start with a, a quick question that I've been wondering about this whole uh, kind of deconfounder um, issue. So um, in in the last uh, the last slides, um, you mentioned that um, you know um, in general settings we may not know what the measured confounders are, et cetera, um, which is kind of like always always the case, of course. Um, and so I was wondering about the deconfounder whether one of the issue was um, you know it makes strong assumptions. Um, and uh, that it's very, very fragile to violations of those assumptions. And as, as Dean pointed out, it's like very kind of, it, it's hard to know what's happening behind the, behind the hood. Is that one of the, one of the concerns that unlike other methods that, you know, all methods are to some extent sensitive to um, uh, violations of assumptions, this one is, is, is very uh, sensitive and in unpredictable ways. I'm not sure that it's more sensitive than other parametric identification strategies. I honestly just don't know, but I think um, it rests on a parametric link between an unobserved variable and observed variables. And that's an unusual strategy that I think when you think about it that way, it's hard to, it, it's hard to think about how in general settings you would justify that. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Um, I was just going to say one of the things that we found in in working with the deconfounder is that it really relies heavily on this idea that there's some fixed small set of confounders that we can then grow the treatments to learn more about that small set of con confounders. If we're in a setting where as we add treatments, say there's some small set of confounders that are introduced affecting only three or four treatments, we could find that growing these treatments, which we need to do to uh, reliably estimate that factor model could actually make our inferences considerably worse because we're sneaking in this, you know, small, not strongly uh, confounded number of treatments. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, Justin um, and Dean and Brandon, do you want to uh, 
do you want to respond to or comment on uh, Betsy's, um, um, Betsy's response or discussion? I mean, we really appreciate it. Thank you. That was, that was fantastic. And, uh, you know, yeah, thank you so much. All right, I have a I have a quick question. Um, I'm not sure kind of have the right intuition here, but uh, so that's for Dean and uh, co-authors. So I had a quick look at your uh, high dimensional setting. So the G was a study, and there, as a naive estimator, you use a rich. If I saw that correctly, right? So in in my intuition, rich. Um, so like just if I think that there's a confounder that affects many of the treatments. <clears throat> And it also affects the outcome. So in my intuition, what, what happens with Rich that it would probably kind of distribute the confounding over kind of over all of the treatments. So it would kind of distribute the arrow, whereas like something like the lasso might put all the weight already like just on a couple of covariates and really mess up those uh, like the estimates for those. So, so what I was wondering, and I'm not sure my intuition is correct here, is whether like Rich already has like a little bit of deconfounding already built in because it like tends to distribute kind of like uh, effects or like or like these these confounding effects compared to the lasso. So my question was like, did, did you already also try like the lasso and other methods? So well, as a naive comparison there, and do you see similar effects there? Um, we we haven't tried um, uh, the lasso. I I don't know that. I mean, there's a this sort of really interesting connection between um, the the sort of basic like PCA structure that's used a lot in genetics and the ridge, where you know it's this distinction between whether or not you are penalizing just on the top k eigenvalues, or you're um, you know sort of penalizing along all the eigenvalues sum as you are in ridge. Um, there is a great paper um, by and I'm. Uh, Guo et al. Um, out of um, uh, Guo, um, Sevedin Bowman, I think is right, um, that covers this lasso case and has some great theoretical results. And I know they're in the, the, the I think they're in the attendees, so maybe they could throw a link in the chat. Um, but that covers the sort of like, um, they call it the dense confounding case, where you have this assumption that the confounding is structured in such a way that the, the lasso is gonna, gonna work out well. And so that'd be a great reference for that. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I think uh, if there are no further questions or comments, um, it's uh, time to wrap up. So uh, first, uh, thank you all for, uh, for, this, uh, for this great uh, talk today. And first, thank you, Dean, for the, for the great and interesting talk. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Betsy, for the great discussion and uh, putting it all into perspective. That was really helpful. Um, so next time, just... Uh, as a quick primer. So next time, we're going to do an interview with Julia Pearl. Uh, this will not be at the usual time. So it will be 1 to 2 p.m. So please, uh, please keep that in mind next week. Uh, yeah, then thank you all for joining and uh, see you see you next time.